So this is Critical Care Essentials Part 2. And as you might remember, if you just go through these lectures, you will get all the knowledge that you require for critical care. So we'll start from revising some stuff from lecture one. Now we know that delivery of oxygen, which is what critical care people do, depends on hemoglobin. So if it is less than seven, I make it seven. In some rare cases, I go up to nine. Saturation, that's the second thing. How much is the hemoglobin saturated? And that can't be more than 100%. And then cardiac output, which is stroke volume into heart rate. And I know that I can increase the stroke volume by optimizing the preload, giving the patient as much fluid as will increase their cardiac output, and then optimizing their ejection fraction and reducing their afterload. We know that a blood pressure mean of 60 to 65 is okay to support life. We know that an oxygen saturation of 85 to 88% might be enough provided that it is circulating, you have a good cardiac output. And the cardiac output really is the one that drives delivery of oxygen. So there's no use of increasing the oxygen from 88 to 94% only to decrease the cardiac output from 7 to 5. That won't help. And maybe a PaO2 of 55 is enough to support life in a critically ill patient. And we know that the best way to look at whether the delivery of oxygen is adequate or not is to look at oxygen extraction ratio. And if this ratio is less than 30%, then the body is being able to take what it needs and you are delivering enough. When we are managing the ventilator, we are really interested in making sure that our ventilator is not injuring our patient. The definition of provider-induced patient deadness, that I have, is a word I've made up, this happens when a provider insists on achieving a normal blood pressure, a normal oxygen, a normal carbon dioxide level in a patient who is very abnormal. So just remember that the problem in becoming a critical care is that you have to understand that you can't make your patient uncomfortable because you are uncomfortable with their numbers or their vitals. We aim to give the minimum support necessary to maintain life while the patient comes out and recovers from his own illness. So if you have sepsis and septic shock, the only thing that is fighting the bacteria is your antibiotic. Everything else, your ultrafiltration and your dialysis and your uh, pressors and the ventilators, we are all only giving support. None of these things is treating the original cause of the illness or the dysfunctional response to it. So by the time you are second years, you will know whether you have the attitude, the character and the way of thinking, which is critical care. So critical care is not a degree. It's not an IQ level. It is an attitude, a way to look at things and put them into the bigger picture. And you either have it or you don't. It can be improved upon, but it usually cannot be generated from thin air. So by the time you are second year, most people will understand whether they want to be critical care and most attendings will understand whether this is somebody who can or cannot be a critical care fellow. Another thing in critical care is if your action did not help, it most likely harmed. So when you act, you always assess. I made a ventilator change. I need an assessment. I gave fluid. I need an assessment. Did it help or not? And if it did not help, ego should not be in the way of reversing your actions quickly. So let's talk about hypoxemia. So everybody has one trachea. And the trachea usually divides into two, left and right bronchi. And then it keeps dividing into uh, almost three lobes on each side. If you say the lingula is the left middle lobe, that's fine. And then it divides into ten segments on each side. 
and then it keeps dividing and dividing until about the 15th division where now your cartilage has disappeared and the walls are becoming thinner and now actual exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide is taking place. And just like the iota divides into smaller and smaller until they become capillaries, it's the same thing here. The trachea has an area of 2.5 cm square. By the time you are in the small subsegmental airways, it is 13 cm square. And by the time you are in your respiratory uh, bronchioles, it sort of like is 300 cm square area. So, similar to blood pressure and capillary pressure, you don't really need much pressure in the capillaries. Uh, you need pressure to drive air into the trachea and all these uh, airways. But once we come to the level of the alveoli, we are basically diffusing because of the difference um, in the concentration of oxygen in the alveoli versus the capillaries. And also the carbon dioxide diffuses in because of the difference between the capillary carbon dioxide and the alveolar carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide diffuses much easier. And at this level, every alveoli is surrounded by a Walmart 400 thread count Egyptian cotton sheet of um, fibers of, of capillaries. They just cover the alveoli like a sheet, like a bed sheet would. So if you look at this and imagine an, a single alveoli uh, surrounded by a single capillary, uh, we can understand the five different ways hypoxemia can occur. The first is low ambient oxygen. You are on Mount Everest or you are um, in a plane and the pressure has gone or I guess uh, some of the bomb blasts, they suck up the oxygen, whatever it is. Low ambient oxygen never really happens in the hospital. There's nothing wrong with the alveoli. Everything is fine. There's nothing wrong with the capillaries. It's your FiO2 which is down. And therefore, your AA gradient is normal and you have low oxygen because you have low oxygen in the air you are breathing. And that, again, never really happens in the hospital. What happens in shunt? In shunt, your alveoli is full of stuff. It could be blood, um, pulmonary hemorrhage. It could be um, fluid, pulmonary edema. It could be pus, consolidation. It could be... Um, mucus, atelectasis, it could be protein ARDS. Something is filling the alveoli. Carbon dioxide diffuses much faster. It is much better. So carbon dioxide is usually fine until the edge stages. Oxygen has a tough time coming in. So you'll have decreased oxygen. You will have increased carbon dioxide only at the end stage. The AA gradient will be elevated and FiO2 itself will not help because what's really happening is the surfactant is getting diluted. So these alveoli close, they have a tough time opening and uh, therefore PEEP is very important in these patients. So a shunt happens when VQ is less than 1, the uh, ventilation is less than the circulation. This can also happen in cases of some pulmonary embolus. Here's your pulmonary arteries that is going into two lungs. There is a pulmonary embolus here. So all the blood now, you know, whatever comes out of the right heart also comes out of the left. So all the blood goes into this lung. So in this lung, ventilation is less than the uh, circulation. VQ is less than one. In this lung, the ventilation is there, but there is no circulation. VQ is greater than one. So we are having dead space in this lung, shunt in this lung. Um, other Types of shunts are the uh, capillary shunting that happens in sepsis, in liver disease, and in, of course, cardiac shunts, etc., etc. You recognize a shunt because it is a hypoxemia problem. Carbon dioxide goes up, as I said later. Uh, it does not respond to FiO2 as much as it responds to PEEP and so on and so forth. The next one is dead space. What happens in dead space? The capillaries are fine, the alveoli are fine, but they are distended. There is no ventilation taking place. Heavily distended alveoli squishing the capillary 
and therefore v is v is greater than q v over q is greater than 1 copd asthma ventilator induced alveolar distension those kind of things this can also happen if your alveoli is fine but your cardiac output is severely reduced that can also give you a vq mismatch dead space here um, carbon dioxide is high oxygen is low aa gradient is um, increased in diffusion what happens is the alveoli have thick walls interstitial lung disease and therefore oxygen finds it difficult to come in again carbon dioxide is a better diffuser so it is normal uh, usually until the end stages so decrease oxygen and um, normal or increase carbon dioxide or increase carbon dioxide during exercise when you are producing more you can't take it out easily um, x-ray will usually help you distinguish between shunt and uh, emphysema and um, diffusion abnormality and here also the aa gradient is increased and this responds to fio2 um, sometimes to peep if there is a restrictive lung disease and then you have hypoventilation nothing everything is okay with your alveoli everything is okay with your capillary sedative obesity hypoventilation um, change of mental status um, a lot of co2 has diffused in the alveoli but then it is not going any further from there so increase co2 decreased oxygen um, and aa gradient is normal okay sorry decrease co2 oxygen increase co2 uh, aa gradient is normal you put them you give them six one breath every six seconds and they do fine 10 breaths a minute is all they need uh, carbon dioxide comes out very fast and the oxygen normalizes so when somebody calls you to manage a ventilator and the problem is hypoxemia you can only change fio2 or peep of course if you're breathing two times a minute yes but if you're breathing eight to ten times a minute the only thing that really fixes your oxygen is either fixing the fio2 or the peep and the fio2 as you know has a limit of 100 percent you can't go above that what is peep supposed to do what is happening here is that in inspiration the alveoli distance uh, opens up some and then in expiration because of whatever is in there it completely closes and then it becomes a wet balloon very difficult to open again it takes a lot of pressure to do that and no oxygen exchange is taking place so end expiratory pressure the inspiration is the same but in expiration let's say you stop it at 10 centimeter h2o so as you expire when your uh, alveolar pressure reaches 10 it stops and so the alveoli remain somewhat open even in expiration oxygen and carbon dioxide is still exchanging and it is open is it is more easily opened with the next breath so that is what peep does now we know that ARDS and even pulmonary edema and all are uh, dependent they are heterogeneous they are they are getting worse as we go to more dependent regions so what you try to do with peep is you try to keep the alveoli which are open you try to keep them open so you maintain that and then you open up the alveoli which are intermediately um, affected uh, to a good degree and you keep the most dependent parts uh, the most consolidated parts open in expiration that's what you want to do but if you keep increasing the peep what might happen is that you over distend these alveoli and increase uh, the dead space v over q is greater than one and then you are opening these middle and the lower one might be too far gone you keep increasing the peep they still don't open this is what you don't want so you want with your peep you want to do this so you know people keep increasing the peep just because a table tells them that hey if your fio2 is 90 percent your peep should be 20 um you need to look at your patient all these guidelines and protocols are framework inside which you do thinking you can't be critical care without 
keeping a brain. So um, use that brain. And when I increase PEEP, I am looking for this effect and I am trying to avoid this effect. But how will I know what's happening? So uh, one way to look at it is look at the volume uh, pressure curve. So just like a wet balloon, what happens is that um, as you increase the pressure on the ventilator, pressure increases, the wet balloon suddenly starts opening up a bit okay so suddenly your volume for the increase in pressure goes up okay the pressure is still increasing but your volume is going up and the alveoli are becoming uh, are becoming more and more happy and then there comes a point where you have reached over distension for majority of the alveoli and now the volume does not increase but the pressure keeps on increasing so this is your uh, lower inflection point. This is your higher inflection point. So most people will say that the peep should be a little bit higher than this so that you don't de-recruit um, on decreasing the pressures. And then the peak inspiratory pressure or the plateau pressure should be somewhere out here so that after that you don't um, over distend. And then your ventilation takes place inspiration, expiration in this safe window which is neither over distension nor de-recruitment. Uh, there are problems with that. We'll come to that later. Um, in another chapter, PEEP itself will be a one-hour lecture. Having said that, if you are over distending, what is happening is, because um, this will go through lungs, okay, and then come back, so what is happening is that the increasing PEEP and increasing mean pressures, because if the PEEP increases, the mean pressure increases, will stop blood from coming into the right atrium. And then because the right atrium and the right ventricle are a low pressure um, uh, chambers of the heart, uh, the pressure in the lung from all over will um, stop the cardiac chambers from filling and then because all the pulmonary vessels are being squished the pulmonary vessels themselves are being squished your afterload increases and therefore the right heart uh, cardiac output goes down that means the left heart uh, filling goes down and so you decrease your cardiac output if your cardiac output is decreased the venous blood that is coming back will come back with less and less saturation you can see that from the first lecture and if your venous saturation coming back is 50 percent then no matter what your ventilator is doing to the lungs you can't expect an arterial pressure of more than 80 percent i mean there's a limit to how much oxygen can be added to the venous oxygen and then recirculated and so that becomes a problem so what will happen is that as you keep increasing your PEEP, you will see that as the alveoli open up and things get better, your oxygen saturation for the same FiO2 keeps increasing. And then you reach a point of over distension and uh, decreasing circulation. And so your oxygen saturation will take a turn for the worse. And therefore, every person has their optimal PEEP. And that optimal PEEP might change as their condition changes. If their ARDS is getting better, this optimal PEEP might come here. If their ARDS is getting worse, this optimal PEEP might go here. We don't know. We have to change the PEEP and we have to see. Now, this happens in real life. Um, many times, uh, for example, when I was in Tulane, I was a first year fellow and my intern, I came in the morning, had the patient on 100% FiO2 and a PEEP of 24 and and pressors and i was like what's the problem he said well the saturation was 88 percent so i increased the peep to 18 then it became 86 percent so i increased the peep to 20 then it became 84 percent i think the ards is getting worse so i made the peep 24 and i was like listen decrease the peep and he was like, how can you say that the oxygen is 84%? How can you decrease the PEEP? Then I said, you have a button. Decrease it. And Dr. Chassie will also tell you that. 
It's very easy to decrease the peep. It is a button on the ventilator or a dial. Dial it down. And then when we went to 16, the oxygen saturation remained 88%. We went to 14, oxygen saturation remained 88%. We went to 12, oxygen saturation was 86%. So we stayed at 14 because what's the use of going up on PEEP from 14 to 16 if it did not change the oxygen saturation? Most likely, if it did not change the oxygen saturation, it definitely decreased the cardiac output. And we deliver oxygen, not saturation, oxygen. So that is an example of how PEEP works and how you can set it on the bedside. But remember, tolerate hypoxemia. Don't just follow the book. Don't just follow the tables. Look at your patient. Now let's talk about hyper and hypocapnia. It's very simple. If I'm producing more CO2 than I'm eliminating, my CO2 will be high. If I'm eliminating more CO2 than I'm producing, it will be low. Anyways, when you are called with a CO2 problem, the only two things you can change on the ventilator are going to be respiratory rate and tidal volume. And which one is more effective? It's, it's an interesting thought. Well, it seems that when we take a breath in, it goes into the trachea, then the main bronchi, then the lobar bronchi, segmental, subsegmental. In none of these places is oxygen exchange taking place. Oxygen exchange starts at the level of the respiratory bronchial. So, this air, which is the last to come in and the first to go out, which does not play any part, is called our natural dead space. In you and me, it is somewhere around 150 ml. Of course, if you are sick, COPD, asthma, ARDS, this dead space is higher, emphysema, right? But let's say it is 150. And now let's assume there is a person that I put on 600 tidal volume and a rate of 10. So now I'm getting a minute ventilation of 6,000 or 6 liters per minute. But wait a minute. Out of this 600, 150 is just dead space. So the air reaching the alveoli and other, uh, let's just say alveoli. The air reaching the alveoli per breath is 600 minus 150 or 450 tidal volume into respiratory rate of 10. So the alveolar minute ventilation is 4.5 liters. Now the same person, I put on 300 tidal volume and a respiratory rate of 20. The minute ventilation is still 6,000. But look, the air reaching the alveoli is 300 minus 150 dead space is equal to 150 into a respiratory rate of 20 is 3000 or 3 liters per minute. Therefore, this person will have a lower carbon dioxide than this person. So the same person will have a low carbon dioxide with a higher tidal volume and a lower respiratory rate. You can do any number of calculations. It still remains the same. A higher tidal volume with a lower respiratory rate, same minute ventilation, minute ventilation is the same. The higher tidal volume and lower respiratory rate combination will be more effective in eliminating CO2. So respiratory rate has a limit, maybe it is 35, maybe everybody is different. I will tell you why. Tidal volume has a limit, maybe 9 cc per kg. So look at all the studies in ARDS and I have read all of them, all of them, okay? 6 cc per kg in ARDS is better than 12, proven, yes, done. 6 cc kg, 6 cc per kg tidal volume is better than 10, yes, done, we know that. We don't know if 6 is better than 9. We do know that a plateau pressure of 30 or less is better than a plateau pressure of 30 or more. So most likely, reducing the tidal volume in ARDS serves the function of reducing the plateau pressure. Because in ARDS net, when 
people were having a pH of less than 7.15 or 7.25, what would they do? They will look at the plateau pressure. And if the plateau pressure is less than 30, they would go up on the tidal volume to 7 or even 8 if needed to try to make the pH better. So as long as the plateau pressure is less than 30, in ARDS, we can go up to 8. So we know that 6 to 8 is fine. In COPD, we don't know whether 6 is better than 9. We don't know that. Again, if the because in COPD and, and asthma, the problem is not compliance. Therefore, plateau pressures are not the problem. Peak pressures are, but not plateau pressures. If your plateau pressure is less than 30, I would go up to 9 cc per kg in a COPD patient. And then because COPD and asthma people have a problem exhaling air, it seems that it seems that 9 liters per minute is the limit after which minute ventilation, if you keep increasing it, you will get air trapping. So what is air trapping? Okay, let me talk about that. So if I have a respiratory rate of uh, 10 per minute, uh, tidal volume of let's say 400 cc, and I am now 10 a minute means 6 seconds for every breath. I get my 400 cc over 1 second and then I have 5 seconds to take it out. So my I is to E ratio is 1 to 5. And then I get my next breath and I take it out and the next breath and I take it out. Now somebody increases my respiratory rate to 20. Now I have only 3 seconds for a breath. One second to get my 400 in, only two seconds to take it out. I is to E is 1 is to 2. What is happening? Before I have exhaled my breath, the ventilator says it's time for another one. Before I have exhaled that, it's time for another one. Before I have exhaled that, it's time for another one. And therefore, I never return to the baseline. I'm stacking every breath. I have more left in my lung. That is called air trapping and hyperinflation. This level is auto peep. And what is happening is my lungs are distending. My LV now has a problem. Uh, you know, uh, in diastole, um, the pulmonary uh, vasculature is all squished. Uh, my preload is down. My afterload is up for the pulmonary pressures. My cardiac output is decreasing. If my cardiac output is decreasing, the CO2 that comes in the capillaries is much higher, even with diffusion. And of course, I'm not ventilating, right? Because I'm air trapping. Um, the CO2 level keeps on rising. And this again happened in Tulane. So the intern and the respiratory therapist and a nurse were at the bedside. A patient had a tidal volume of 600, a respiratory rate of 20 um, and the pH was 7.25 and the PCO2 was around 90. Increase the rate to 24, the pH became 7.20, um, CO2 became 100, increase the rate to 28, pH became 7.15, this is 110, increase the rate to 30, pH is 7.10, PCO2 is 130 or something and now the oxygen and the blood pressure is dropping. The patient is blue. They give me a call. I tell them from home, I, am, I tell them to take the patient off the ventilator. They say you are, the, the respiratory came um, on the phone and she shouted at me, what are you talking about and basically refused to listen. So now I got a ticket on the camera because I ran two red lights. I, I came to Tulane in 12 minutes. The nurse was calling Dr. Francisco Simeone, my program director, telling them that I'm absolutely stupid. He was telling them the same thing. And I had to physically fight the respiratory therapist to take the patient off the ventilator. A long exhalation followed, blood pressure and oxygen became better, 
patient color turned from blue to pink and we kept him on a respiratory rate of 14 at which time tidal volume was still 600 he was a tall guy uh, re uh, respiratory rate was 14 ph was 7.3 and uh, pco2 was somewhere around 80 and we said we are going to tolerate this again just because your book says a certain thing and you are not comfortable with this number, you are going to kill the patient. So, I am not comfortable with this number, so neither can my patient be. Okay? So, that's um, critical care. And you either have it or you don't. Do not forget atelectrauma. Okay? We talk about barotrauma, plateau pressure less than 30. We talk about volume trauma, uh, tidal volume 6, even 5 or 4. But we forget atelic trauma. These sticky ARDS alveoli, every time we open and close them, the uh, pressure and the movement required, inflammatory mediators are leaked out into the circulation. And that causes a sepsis like picture, it causes a SERS, um, vasodilatation and so on and so forth. So, if my patient is having a pH of 7.2 at a rate of 25 and then at a rate of 35, he has a pH of 7.3. What have I really done? Because first of all, hypercarbia in these states actually leads to improved cerebral circulation and improved uh, responses of the body immune system and vasodilation system to, to pressors, etc., etc. No, sorry, not pressors. Um, Leofed actually does not work well with acidosis. But um, that is, happens less than 7.15 where you start thinking about bicarbonate. But it actually has some good effects on the human body in this state. So, by increasing the respiratory rate from 25 to 35, if that is all I have achieved, I would rather go back to 25. Why is that? Because breathing 25 uh, per minute, my patient is getting 36,000 ventilator breaths a day. At 35 per minute, the ventilator breaths are 50,400. That is 14,400 openings and closings of sick alveoli every day. So if my patient is on the ventilator for 7 days, that is... 100,800 more openings and closings of the alveoli. And we forget that volume trauma and barotrauma and atelect trauma are three ways that we can really um, mess somebody up on a ventilator. How do you calculate ideal body weight? If you look at the book, they will say for a woman, it is 45.5 kg for the first 50, for the first 5 feet and then 2.3 kg per inch. That is very hard to calculate on the bedside. And as it is, you are going to change it for plateau pressure, right? So, I use 45 kg for 5 feet and then 2.5 kg per inch. It's a much easier calculation in your head. For a man, 50 kg for 5 feet and then 2.5 kg per inch. So, let's look at this. There's a 6 foot man, which is also 5 feet 12 inches. So, for 5 feet, he gets 50. And for 12 inches, he gets 30. 50 plus 30 is 80. So, if this person is ARDS, I'll start with 6 per kg, which is 480 cc tidal volume. If it is 8 cc per kg, I will go to 640 cc per kg tidal volume. Uh, for COPD asthma. If it is a 5 foot 2 inch woman, she has a 50 kg, 45 plus 2.5 into 2, comes very, very close. 6 cc per kg, I will give her a tidal volume of 300. 8 cc per kg, give a tidal volume of 400. Therefore, sometimes when I go to the ICU and then because of a certain respiratory therapist liking 400, some like 350, some like 450, everybody is on 400. But just remember, if it is a 5 foot woman, 400 would become 9 cc per kg. So be very careful. Always calculate. You become faster the more you calculate. So what happens um, 
why do we need a peep to begin with and what are the different pressures i will talk about that now so the ventilator will not allow you to exhale more than the peep then you get an inhalation and once that inhalation is over if you do an inspiratory hold inspiratory hold of 0.5 to 1 second 0.5 to 1 seconds the airway resistance is no longer there because air is not moving and then the pressure decreases and this is your pressure plateau pressure which is the pressure in your alveoli so by decreasing the tidal volume we are trying to limit the plateau pressure we are trying to limit the distending pressure inside the alveoli okay now you exhale and then you come back to your peep the difference between peak pressure which is the pressure that is happening when you are actually inhaling so there is flow and plateau pressure is the difference is airway resistance if you have mucus in the airway if you have a kinked airway if you have a small sized et tube if there is a bronchospasm this airway resistance will increase the normal is around 5 cm h2o i will talk to you about that also why is peep necessary because um normal people don't have peep but peep is necessary to keep the alveoli open uh during exhalation because sick people are bed bound and normally we move and when we are sleeping in the bed for a long time we have um um atelectasis at the bases and that is mucus stagnation and then you have vap and stuff like that so in order to prevent that a peep of 5 is usually needed if you are not ards there's another reason the tube has to fit in the uh, trachea so obviously it is smaller than the trachea and we know that flow in any tube will have resistance and that will lead to a pressure difference between the mouth or where the et tube is ending and the carina where where the et tube stays and that difference p1 minus p2 depends on flow so the higher the flow of the gas the more the pressure difference but it also depends on resistance and resistance we know is 8 into viscosity of air which is the same uh, that is the reason why you use heliox um, because the viscosity is lower i guess and then you have the length of the tube which is usually similar and then pi r4 this is the major thing so the more your radius the bigger the tube the less the resistance the flow in normal trachea is not laminar there's a lot of turbulence in a tube it is laminar flow so if you ask me if i put somebody a tube of 10 or 12 or a bigger size than 10 their resistance might actually be lower than normal trachea but usually we use a, a tube of 7.5 to 9 and that will be a higher resistance than normal breathing so a tube of 7.5 will have a pressure difference of around 7 cm h2o and a tube of 9 will have a difference of around 5 cm h2o therefore when you are inhaling through a tube you have to generate a pressure force of 5 to 7 cm h2o and when you are exhaling into that straw you have to again exert pressure so that's work of breathing therefore if i keep somebody on a pressure support of 5 to 7 and a peep of 5 to 7 then when they are taking a breath in the 5 to 7 pressure support helps them overcome the resistance and so they are almost like they are breathing on without a tube okay and then when they try to exhale out by having a peep of 5 to 7 i create the same situation like a copd patient a pursed lip breathing they are trying to create an auto peep so that they can exhale so by equalizing this difference by keeping a peep of 5 to 7 i make it easy for exhalation to happen and therefore when i do my weaning trial 
if you have a tube of 7 to 8, the weaning trial is on pressure support 7 by 7. And if you have a tube of 8.5 or 9, the pressure support trial is on 5 to 5. Because I am creating the same condition as if you don't have a tube in you by overcoming that resistance to flow. Okay? So that is why PEEP is important and that is why we always have people on 5. Again, when you set your ventilator, you have to look at the patient. Because if you see on the ventilator that your plateau pressure is less than 30, you are really have happy because that means the alveolar pressure is less than 30. But that might not be the case. Because transpulmonary pressure is equal to this plateau pressure minus pleural pressure. And if your patient is struggling against the ventilator and making a pressure of minus 20, for example, really trying to struggle against that breath, then your transpulmonary pressure is not 30. That's your plateau pressure. It's 30 minus minus 20, which is 30 plus 20, or an intra-alveolar pressure of 50. Therefore, barotrauma can happen even with a plateau pressure of 30 because you forgot about pleural pressure. So, look at patient ventilator asynchrony, dyssynchrony. If the patient is trying to take a breath and you can see that and then you see the ventilator and the ventilator is not giving a breath, you decrease the sens increase the sensitivity of the ventilator so that the patient gets the breath. Otherwise, they can create significant amount of pleural pressure. If the patient is getting a breath, look for double triggering. Here what is happening is, the poor patient is taking a breath. The ventilator is giving the breath at let's say 60 liters per minute flow. The patient wants more. He is air hungry. So he pulls against the ventilator. And then he can't pull anymore. He gives up. And then the ventilator catches. In this condition, if the tidal volume is 400, I will keep it at 400. I will increase the flow to 70 or 80 liters per minute. And then the, the, the ventilator curves become better. In this case, where the first peak is lower than the second peak, it is a flow problem. Here what is happening is, there is no flow problem. The patient is taking the 400 that you are giving. And then when you stop the breath, he's like, no, dude, I want 600. So he triggers the ventilator again. But the problem is the ventilator will give you 400 for every trigger. So this guy is getting 800. You told the respiratory therapist tidal volume of 400. You then went and checked, looked at the ventilator. Tidal volume is 400. If you don't look at the patient, you will miss the fact that they are getting 800. In this case, I would increase the tidal volume of 500. Oh, still trouble triggering. 600. Aha. No problem. So in this case, I would rather give a tidal volume of 600 and then get told that that's not what the book says than to leave it at 400. All my boxes are checked but the patient is actually getting 800. So you always look at the patient. So the last thing for today. If you have an oxygen saturation problem, you can only change the FiO2 or PEEP. FiO2 can be maximum 100%. PEEP will have a maximum. You will find out what that is. With a CO2, I can increase the tidal volume or respiratory rate. It is better to increase the tidal volume first. Don't go more than 9 cc per kg. And then you can only increase the respiratory rate. It has a limit. We will figure out what later by experimenting on the bedside. So if the patient has ARDS, you start with a tidal volume of 6 cc per kg. Let's say this is 400. Then the respiratory rate. You want a minute ventilation starting of around 8, so the respiratory rate will be 20. I e is to E of 1 is to 3 because these patients don't have a problem exhaling. Their lungs have low compliance. They will exhale. PEEP, 
is starting at 5, FiO2 at 100%. Now I look at the plateau pressure. If the plateau pressure is greater than 30, I decrease the tidal volume to 5. Wait for 10 breaths. Plateau pressure still greater than 30. I decrease the tidal volume to 4. Wait for 10 breaths. If it is still greater than 30, I start playing with the I's to E. So what happens is instead of giving a tidal volume in less time, I give the tidal volume in more time. So decrease the, the pressures here, the driving pressure. And I can increase the I is to E, 1 is to 2, 1 is to 1. I don't usually do the opposite, 2 is to 1. I stay at 1 is to 1. If the plateau pressure is still greater than 30, I then either tolerate it or paralyze and prone the patient. Okay. If my pH is less than 7.25, despite knowing that increasing tidal volume is better than increasing respiratory rate, in ARDS, we are trying not to increase the tidal volume. So I increase the respiratory rate slowly. See what happens. I go to a maximum of 35. If that doesn't work and if the plateau pressure is less than 30, I can actually increase my tidal volume to 7. Give it 10 breaths. See what happens to your end tidal CO2. Even go to 8. I don't go more than 8. And then you set your PEEP to oxygen saturation. Um... If suppose somebody has um, FiO2 of 100%, PEEP of 5, and their oxygen saturation is 92%, let's say 88%. So I make the PEEP 7, saturation becomes 92%. I make the FiO2 80, saturation goes back to 88. Hmm, I, I had a positive response. I make it 9, saturation goes to 92. I make my... FiO to 70%, saturation goes back to 88. Hey, I made an improvement. I make it 11, saturation goes to 84. Nah, I'll stick with 9 and 70. The idea is to try to get the oxygen down to 60% if you can. Uh, prevents oxygen-induced atelectasis, absorption atelectasis because nitrogen gets washed out and blah, blah, blah. Um, but that's that's the whole idea. And at this level, at your level, that is a good way to do it. Every change you make, just make sure you look at your um, outcomes so that you know whether you did a good thing or a bad thing. If somebody comes in with COPD or asthma, I start with a tidal volume of 8 cc per kg, a respiratory rate of 12, inspiratory to expiratory ratio 1 is to 3, PEEP of 5, FiO2 of 100%. Then I decrease the FiO2 to keep a saturation of 88% is fine. 94% if you're having stroke or heart disease, um, you know, those kind of things. If the pH is less than 7.25, I look at my plateau pressure. If the plateau pressure is fine, I would rather increase my tidal volume first. And if that uh, doesn't work, then I increase my respiratory rate. I check for auto peep, which is an expiratory hold. So if your PEEP is set at 5 and you do an expiratory hold and it is 7, that means you're having an auto PEEP of 2. In that case, once you reach a tidal volume of 9, what you can do is that you can increase the respiratory rate, of course, but you can also increase the inspiratory to expiratory ratio, give them more time to exhale. Um, increasing the inspiratory to expiratory ratio more than 1 is to 5 does not really help. After that, I have the choice of either tolerating the pH, um, you know, that, that would be the thing to go. And as uh, patients improve, their COPD asthma improves, their bronchodilatation, um, bro bronchoconstriction gets better, uh, their pH will improve by itself. So DO2, the minimum needed to support patient through their illness. And second thing is do, DO2, no harm. Do your best uh, to improve their numbers. But don't forget to tolerate a pH of even 7.15 and an oxygen saturation of 85%. If anything you are doing to improve that is decreasing your cardiac output, increasing the lung pressures, increasing the atelectrauma, barotrauma, volute trauma, then you are better off being comfortable with these numbers. And the patient will improve with your support. You don't control the patient, you support the patient. Thank you so much.